We've got to get to Jamie. Jay yes. and, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. So okay. you got you started working at um, what was what was the studio you worked at then? It was called Gallery Studios. It was in Chertsey, and uh, when I started there, it was just entering a busy period. Um, they were uh, they were developing it a bit, building an extra studio out the back, um, and the owner had just produced an album. Um, for a for a South American band a couple of years before that had been a massive hit and uh, suddenly was getting more work as a producer and had made a contact with a couple of labels and managers. I mean, I think he had he had been producing. For so this is years. Phil Manzanera from Roxy Music. Phil Manzanera, sorry, yeah, yeah I didn't say the um, yeah the guitarist from uh, Roxy Music. So he had produced before, I think he did stuff with uh, Split Ends, who turned into Crowded yeah. House. I think that it was as Split Ends, not as Crowded House, in the early 80s, and he'd produced some other things. But um, he, he suddenly started really taking off in South America because of these couple of albums he had done that had become big hits. So suddenly lots and lots of bands were coming over to use to use the studio. It wasn't really commercial, the studio. It was his home studio. And he could afford to have it as like a luxury <clears throat> that he would use himself or loan it out to friends, not necessarily charging them. He had a label going as well, which I think he probably regretted because he spent a lot on that. But, but the money was coming in, you know, and they needed more people. So I went for six weeks and at the end they said, well, actually, we, we do need some more. Do you want you know, let's stay and do this album that's coming up with this German band or this, you know, another band from Spain coming over? So I just, I stayed. I wasn't sound engineering. I was just driving the bands around into London, you know, on touristy trips or driving them home <laughs> at night or going to pick them up in the morning from their house because obviously they'd have to rent a, a house over here for the band somewhere near the studio and cooking for them. <laughs> oh, no, really? Ice cream. <laughs> ice cream and stolen packs of peanuts. They liked to work. <laughs> yeah, there were, there were two or three of us doing it. Um, and the budgets were really were quite big. This was like bands from EMI, EMI Brazil, or you know, and the the it was before labels had started really cutting down on expenses. <laughs> um, early nineties, so they were still the money was being splurged ridiculously. So we had like really expensive hire cars that, that me and Trapper, the other guy who was doing the job, were allowed to drive around in. <laughs> Um, to pick the bands up and the, and just splurging every day we'd get a big envelope of cash from the owner and uh, wow. and uh, be kind of carte blanche in a way to to spend it on food and petrol and other stuff <laughs> um, in fact, other criminal, things going back, other things going back to the criminality question yeah there was a lot more of it suddenly started occurring in the music industry um, about that time. In fact, he said, the, uh, Phil, the owner, there were a couple of albums he did where uh, envelopes were exchanged outside of record company really? <laughs> knowledge. Yeah, I probably shouldn't have told you this. <laughs> But I'm guessing then, I mean, because what you've just described is the perfect storm for borderline criminality stroke great anecdote. So um, what, what, what can you remember or what, were there any specific and probably anonymous moments where you thought, wow, this is going to go wrong <laughs> or, or end up in hospital? Um, well, some days, some, it depended on the band and the personalities in the band, but, and whether they'd bought wives and girlfriends who were then just sitting around with nothing to do. There were quite a few of those scenarios and we had, well, there was one artist, oh, he's dead now, so we can probably, Antonio Vega, his name was. And he was, he was a massive heroin addict and was kind of recovering and trying to get off heroin. The, the, they were trying to, the engineer kind of became quite close with him and he was trying to get him off heroin by plying him with huge amounts of cannabis. 
But the other, when he, he would have breakdowns and ask to try and get hold of heroin. And the other guy that was doing the driving, I mean, I don't know why he did it. He went, he went and tried to buy heroin <laughs> because, he'd been, because he'd been asked to by this. He didn't know how to do it. He didn't have someone. He didn't have a clue. He didn't have a clue. He just went, he thought I'd just drive up to London and kind of go around some places and see if I can buy heroin. Like, we would, t- we would just stand trapped. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> Just say no. Just don't. Just say no. I don't even think he told Phil, the, the owner of the studio, but I think he quite liked hanging with the band and was a bit kind of yeah, yeah I'll, I'll get. That. <laughs> um. So yeah, I I steered clear of all that. I tried to steer clear of all that. So who, who were the um? Well, were there any difficult people you worked with? Who does anyone stick out? Yeah, lots. Yeah, lots, but maybe not. Not um. <clears throat> I don't. I don't remember anyone being kind of unpleasantly horrible like that. They were just. I think they were just famous rock stars, and the kind of the world revolves around them. And they end up making your life really difficult because of that. Not necessarily by being unkind or just. Uh, you know, certain members of the band want to start work at. 10 in the morning and but the singer can't really sing unless it's two in the morning and they've so they'd sleep so your day so my day was was hugely long because you had to be there for everybody and the engineer so you're starting early but then you also still have to be there at two in the morning when the singer being a diva suddenly decides they want to yeah do their work so <clears throat> there's no i don't remember anyone being horrible just maybe carried away a bit with their ego but it's fine because behind the glass, you and the other you and the other staff can kind of laugh at them <laughs> at their ridiculousness <laughs> while while they're off mic while while, while they you know while the talkback button's not down. <laughs> so it was, and you're in quite a nice environment, so you could get over the the stresses and strains of people being a bit of a dick. And where any of? But yeah, there was lots of dickish behaviour, but not really rock stars being unpleasant just being egotistical in way. just being divas yeah and demanding what was um what's Paul? you did a lot of work with paul weller right what, yes well where does yeah. he come on that in that uh, category is he was he considerate or? oh he, yeah yeah he's he's he was great actually he's always been he's very um he's always had like a loyal crew that worked with him and uh, I think he inspires affection in that way, actually, from his crew. It's quite loyal kind of grouping. And, uh, yeah, and in a sense, we became, he came to the studio in 97, maybe, 96, 97. Um, <clears throat> and he was looking for a new studio to record in because he used to record in the, a place called The Manor. And liked it there, and this place kind of reminded him a bit of that. And we had a bit, a little bit of a family vibe in the studio there as well, amongst the staff, the man, the girl who used to manage the studio. It's like a nice team you're part of. And he really liked that. And we kind of, there was like a crossover of the different teams, his team and our team. We all got on quite well. You know, and we and hung out a bit. You know, outside the studio and in the studio. So yeah, that was nice, actually. No, he's great. He's very um, and kind of lets you get on with stuff as well. He's not like a giving out orders all the time to everybody. He wants to hire someone that's that can do their job and then let them get on with yeah. their job. He doesn't want to have to fuss over dealing with stuff that you're doing. He wants to deal with his thing and let you get on with your thing. What I, I, wasn't there an occasion where you went to Switzerland and nearly worked with Elton John? <laughs> Phil, Phil Collins. Collins. <laughs> Not Elton. No, I did work with Phil. Nice one, I, I got <clears throat> I got sacked off of doing that. Yeah, I got fired. <laughs> we yeah we went. Uh, Phil yeah Phil Collins was lovely as well. Really really nice guy. I, so I didn't get fired by him. I got fired by the American producer who was a dick. 
So what happened? Um, we went, yeah, we went to Switzerland to, uh, he had made an album and they were kind of demos, but good, good kind of demos. And we went, me and another guy, a programmer, the, the label had basically said, yeah, there's this album, but it needs, it needs tarting up. It, it's not enough. And there's these two Americans from, you know, the Disney. I think it was an American that Phil Collins had done The Lion King with or something right. like that. And they were going to come over and, and mix it and produce it, but it needed some, some grit in there. So me and another guy had gone over to, to do that. And uh, so, yeah, we, we were staying in Neon just on the lake there. And he had this fantastic house up in the mountain. We'd go and hang out there and kind of do a lot of computer transferring and then came back another time to do the album. That's when I got fired. Because we kept, <laughs> we were slight, there's a difference between the way the Americans work. There's a lot more belligerence amongst the English and a kind of, fuck it, you know, it's, it's music. <laughs> yes, take it seriously, but you, it, there's a kind of, not, not an amateurism, that would be the wrong word. Just Corinthianism. A, a Corinthianism, I like that. Yeah, it's something, uh, some grit in there, or some. And Americans, whenever I've worked with this, but this is a huge uh, brush. To, it, it might be very unfair, but all the Americans I've worked with in music, they were far too kind of uptight, and it needs to be sl and slick in a way that didn't seem right to me with music. They can um, be very earnest. I, I spent most so of my career honest. working with Americans and <clears throat> there's many aspects to that slickness that, that I really enjoy, but gosh, they do take themselves seriously, too seriously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think this was the problem on this. It, everything was that they were taking themselves far too seriously. And we had had a really great fun few weeks before they came out and suddenly it became really oppressive and kind of, Oh, and I didn't, yeah, I didn't respond well. I ended up getting, getting sacked. Yeah. They're more hotel, the Americans are more hotel, it. whereas you're more sort of Royal Mail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I still can't imagine how anyone could ever sack you, Jamie. What happened? Oh, I think the producer didn't really like me. He didn't really like me. And the, and the computer was, was breaking down a lot of the time. I was sat huddled in a tiny little corner behind the desk, um, trying to operate the record, the Pro Tools, the recording uh, hardware, and it kept breaking down. I think they thought I wasn't up to it, which might have been <laughs> true. <laughs> it might have been true. What, what is it? Um, <laughs> what does this button do? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't quite that bad. It wasn't quite that, but there'd be, you know, there'd be long pauses while they await for me to, uh, to press play. Uh, yeah, it's not what, just, just give me a second. <laughs> um, so, and so, yeah. And we were, I, I kept, I got in trouble a few times. I, we, we were taking the piss out of some of them. And I think they overheard, <laughs> I think they might have overheard us laughing, but I was the one that got caught. Well, one of the, one of them, one of them was, trying to make a cup of tea and he filled the kettle and put it on, put the kettle, it was a plastic, you know, kettle and filled the kettle and then put it on the gas hob and turned the gas flame on. So the, so the kettle melted all over the, all over the oven. And I was, I, I was going, what a dick, what the, what's he doing? Anyway, they, I think they might have heard me doing that. So I got in a bit of trouble. Actually, it was a library. But if I had been an English band, if that had been the star of the, and they would have gone, fuck off. What, uh, and it would have been, whereas they took high offence to having the piss taken out of them in some way. Yeah, they don't uh, like it, do they? Yeah. Oh, you can't do that. He's the he's the engineer. You can't laugh at the, the star. Well, why can't yeah. he? Yeah. Well, he wasn't even the star. He was just the engineer, but saw, you know, a famous engineer that worked with you, blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah. You mustn't, you mustn't laugh <laughs> at them. I mean, yeah, I didn't like I was glad I did. <laughs> Can I ask about Robert Wyatt? What was tell us about working with him? Because he's another big guy, isn't he? Yeah, Robert Wyatt. I I had honestly I knew the name, 
when I first heard it. I was so it was, we were working on I can't remember what the album was we were doing, but someone called up and I spoke to him. He said who he was, and I thought, oh, I know that name. And he wanted to speak to Phil. So him and Phil go back quite a long way. I think they knew each other in the seventies. Um, and he had uh, he had just been through. I think he was. Uh, He'd been through a bad alcoholic episode a few years. Things had been going downhill for him. He hadn't been recording. But he'd been doing bits and bobs at home and he just needed, he need, his wife needed to get him out of the house and doing something, I think. Or he was, he has talked about, you know, he was on a real downward slide. And he had gone through different periods in his life with that. Um, drinking too much and depression and I guess. And so his wife was kind of Alfie was really keen that he should do something. He needed to do something and had persuaded him to phone Phil just out of the blue. I don't think they'd spoken for years to just to ask, could he have some studio time? And Phil, Phil's great. Cause he's so excited by just being in music, I think, and having <laughs> friends that do music. He just loves doing that, that he just loves the whole thing he's in. So he's quite upbeat about it, about, being able to help, you know, having a studio and he's, yeah, of course you can. Yeah. Come in and help come in and use the studio whenever you want. And he, um, and he said, I should do it. So I, and this would have been my first, I had engineered, <laughs> but for, yeah. for, for you, so you <laughs> cut your teeth with us then for heroes for other local bands <laughs> that were your teeth cut, I cut my teeth with you guys and other bands from the local area that you know bands that the manager of the studio yeah. knew that we'd get they'd come in and they'd basically pay 20 quid or whatever to me or or Charles the other yeah. engineers it's quite clever Phil Phil used to, to let, let, to let that it happen isn't it? it's good training ground for me and the other engineers well. yeah 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 and it's and it's product how else are you going to get the experience you can't just and plus bits of engineering while the actual engineer is there you're basically assisting an engineer so you you i mean you're making tea but also you're plugging things in for them you're writing down the way certain equipment is set up for them keeping notes doing doing the odd job so they can sit there at the desk and do do their engineering <laughs> so um and occasionally they'd have to pop out and they go oh, you just take over for a bit so you're watching them work and then you, yeah. you step into the chair for a bit and then you're out again and then they can kind of keep an eye on you so this was so yeah so this would have been my first experience as you are going to be the engineer that you are in the, the main seat from day one and i didn't really have an assistant it was just m me and him he's in the wheelchair obviously so he kind of would tend to park up for the day and at the, in the studio and kind of, so it wasn't like you had a drummer in guitarist in quick, let's set the amps up. Now we've got to take the kit down and now we've got to set up. It wasn't like that at all. It's just me and him. Um, and it was, it was great actually. It was, I suppose in a way it's a yeah, gentle yeah. way to introduce, <clears throat> you know, to not have all that chaos going on around you and it being like, unique it's really in that situation. Or you work with one thing at a time. Yeah, yeah, unique, really. Yeah, it's not normal. Not normal. You'd normally have a band there and lots of people coming and going and different opinions. Um, so it was, it, it, I mean, in a sad way, <laughs> it was my, my favourite thing I ever did was the, first, was the first thing I ever did. I was downhill from, from then on. But yeah, so what was that back, album? It was one of the most enjoyable. Oh, albums, yeah, yeah. I I've got some yeah. stuff on that. <laughs> It was called Sleep. Yeah. S E H L E E P, and it was the his first album for a while. Um, and it, uh, actually, Paul came and played on it. So the the thing with the Weller was around the same. So time. Paul Weller's a fan of Robert Wise. A few months earlier, kind of, they was the same year. And <laughs> well, he is. He was. He is now. I, yeah. I don't know how much he'd heard of him before. I think he definitely knew him. He definitely knew who he was and knew who Soft Machine was. Um, and he uh, he came in to record stuff for 
with Robert, yeah, when, when we started doing the album. And they had exchanged notes because they'd passed in the studio. Um, some of them, they hadn't overlapped, but Paul had been in and then he went away and then we started sleep and then went away and then Paul came back in again to do more of his album. So there was like a, they used to leave notes for each other. Yeah, I'll come in and do this, that and the other. And that was magical. Yeah, that was fantastic because Paul really got into it and ended up just coming and hanging out during the during the recording of Sleep and helping with the mixing. I think at first the intention was just to get Paul in to, to, to pl play a bit of guitar and that would be it. But they really got on and he, and he really enjoyed the yeah. album so he became a lot more involved with it. And Brian Eno was playing on it, so I got to meet Eno. Uh, um, and he and these are and he's very good mates with. They go back a long way, I think, definitely to the what's Eno 60s, like? Sixties, seventies. They've known each other for a long time. <laughs> he's great as well. He's really he's just a geeky nerd. He's a geeky nerd that likes that likes sitting there and having a tinker with the music. He's re really, really nice. He, uh, he he gave me a lot of comp, a lot of comp. I, I don't find I'm influenced a lot yeah. by a musician, but well, I, I'm, I mean, you must be, but I'm not conscious of it. I don't, I don't know. Well, I would find it hard to say, oh, what musics are you influenced by? But the producers that I've worked with, I could definitely say he had an he had an influence. It was quite eye opening seeing someone like that because and I, I don't really get starstruck but you but yeah, you are aware same. that it, you know he knows done of what he's done and who he's worked with so you're very conscious of well if he's doing this and he's worked and he this is how the best album some of the best albums you've ever heard yeah. are done i he, you know you learn you learn from that so he was he was so kind of laid back about stuff he wanted to sing something so i was Okay, God, I've got to get a mic in the studio, and it needs to be the best mic, and I'll set it up. And he was like, "Oh no, no, I just want to hold a hold a hold that shit mic over there and do it." And I'm like, oh, okay, and then so I can, I'll take that out to the live room. He said, "No, no, I don't want to do it in the live room. Just in front of the speakers here would be fine." And he was yeah. so kind of, in, I, I was thinking, "Oh, that's." sloppy what are we just getting a demo of it and we'll do the proper thing afterwards it's like no, no this is the real this is this is the thing and so it was very much about capturing um he needed to be comfortable and enjoying himself and getting off on the thing and if he went out in the library yeah. and had headphones on and clinically trying to do it's not his thing so he wanted to be <laughs> in front of the speakers and I would be, oh, yeah. yeah, but there'd be spill. How will I cope? How will technically will I? He went, no, 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 it'll be fine. I did. So he's not technically minded, nor is Phil technically minded. Um, so that was that kind of puts you at ease a bit. It yeah. makes you think, ah. Oh, okay. Were you able to? That's, um, that's were you able to sort of carry that on? Did you take that on? Were you and able to, to resist the urge to put up the best mic? And the... yeah, I would. Yeah. I no, well, it gave me confidence to then be able to say to other artists, no, I, did. I think in my mind I had a, a, in my mind I thought, and this is partly because of what other sound engineers had made me think, they'd, they'd sold it to me badly, I think, what sound engineering was. There must be a, there's a way of doing this. There's the, yeah. the technical, you know, the technically correct way of doing it. And I hadn't been to, you know, sound engineering school yeah. I, I didn't know what i was kind of doing really <laughs> apart but but i think a lot of engineers start like that and i and a lot of the engineers i had been assisting at the beginning did make it seem like it's a bit of a dark art and they weren't good at explaining what they were doing and i don't think they wanted to explain what they were doing and then I started working with one guy in particular who just made it seem so much cooler. He was just, he was cooler as a person. He was, everything was really relaxed. He wasn't talking about it in a technical point of view, from a technical point of view, even though there were technical that, issues, but he was on top of it. And knew. So the combination of working with him, a guy called Ash House, was, his name was Ash, Ash House. Um, and working with him was transformative. So I'd been working with him on the, the on assisting him on albums before I then did this stuff. 
So I got a lot of confidence from him. And then these experiences with Eno and Paul as well was similar in that they would push boundaries <laughs> yeah. of things in the way you'd think, oh, but technically I'm not supposed to do that. But actually that's what artists are doing all the time, T turning the knob further than you're supposed to turn it, <laughs> you know, making it louder than you're supposed to make it. And listening back now, you think, well, yeah, yeah. that sound, it sounds right. And it was boring before. Oh, you know, that kind of thing. It gave me a confidence then when I went into production to go, well, <laughs> hang on. I've, I've, I mean, I wouldn't say, do you know who I've worked with? But inside you're thinking, well, actually, I know yeah. that's not, I can, I can be, I can confidently say, no, we're not doing it that way. We're doing it this way because I want to do it that way. And I, I like the sound of yeah. doing that. So you go with your instincts. I think that's what it is. If you instinctively feel something, I have the confidence to then do yeah. it because I've seen them do it. Does it matter it. when... And they're, and they're at the top of the industry. So, no, I was going to say, you know, that I, I think I, we I, talked once about our shared yeah, uh, teenage experiences of going to the same sort of gigs in when we were teenagers. So like, we had a similar sort of in, background in music in terms of taste. When you're working in a studio, how how difficult is it, or how important yeah. is it that you like that sort of music? Is it is it does it make it easier or harder, or does it eventually not really? It's irrelevant. <clears throat> eventually, I don't think it. I I always managed to find something I liked about everything that I recorded. I mean, there were, there were some bands that we got uh -huh. from South America where it was, it was a bit bland. It wasn't, the songs were really simple and they weren't great players, but you still, you're listening, you're listening to sounds and you're trying to, you're trying to balance the drum <laughs> yeah. sound with the bass. It's always kind of enjoyable. <laughs> even if the music, and even if it's a, kind of shitty song you end up you you end up bop, you know your head's still gonna bop a little bit you have a sense of humor about it yeah i mean you have to have a sense of humor about it and you can't yeah I, i'm not a kind of divery <laughs> type that every album i'm doing it so i'm creatively in my space and I, it, you you know you're trying to get just get you have to get the work done they're in for a limited time it costs you money so there's an approach you're coming in with, with this is just a job and I'm not going to, yeah. I don't, there's no space or time here for me to be like a creative. No, we must do it again, but you must be in a, in a, you know, we need to change the dynamic, you know, you just, you've got, just got to get through it. And, uh, and it still enjoy, it's still enjoyable. I, I, and quite a lot of the time, like a lot of the bands we were doing, it's not in English. I thought I would really struggle with that, <laughs> but, um, I, it didn't really affect it at all, really. It didn't really so it affect doesn't... the no. So I think the answer is no. You don't have to. You don't have to enjoy it. Yeah. And you, and you wouldn't be able to do it as a job if if you did. I mean, when you say for so, for example, you might record a a, a, a small orchestra, and you, it's just an orchestral part. But you put <laughs> the mics up and you hear about the violin coming in. And you think, oh, that sounds beautiful. And then you put the top, you know, that sounds beautiful. And in a sense, you're not judging the musical part or the, I mean, you're hoping that the, you know, the producer and the, the person who's arranged the streams yeah. have done all that. You're just working from a sound point of view. On some, al on some albums, on other albums, you, you, you're also producing. But so you're always kind of enjoying it because you're always listening for the sound things. And enjoying the balance of the the, I think the, you do, the sounds are making together when they're you do need some patience though to hear the same song and you're getting that in all genres of music. I, I mean, there are some songs I hear on you know in the charts or whatever, and I just think, oh god, how yeah. did they ever get through recording that? Because I'm so bored of it within within hearing it the first time, and it's gone round to repeat that melody, the fourth chorus yeah. or whatever. So wow. Imagine and then going on tour with it and going to little TV studios all around Europe and the, and and standing on stage and miming to it and then and then yeah. doing that if that's a big hit, doing that singing that or miming to it for thirty years or like how can you do it? It's so I'm so bored. I've only heard it once. Yeah. How would you manage to do it over three or four days of just just that song for three or four days? Yeah. Yeah, 
it is you do need a lot of patience you do need a lot of patience i suppose if you're engineering when you're hearing yeah. it you're trying to change the context a lot so you're listening to just the drums and then maybe you add the bass in and and then you and then you might listen to the whole song yeah. as a piece not as often maybe as you'd think you're working on little chunks you do have to have some distraction tactics though and i found as i got older i would need to get get up and leave the computer that's partly sitting in front of a computer that killed it for me a bit but um yeah you did have to give yourself little breaks i i would find like you could do an hour and then even if it's just a minute just go outside yeah. have a fag or a cup of tea for a minute just leave the room for just a minute and then come back in and you're usually working with a different you know if it's a band yeah. you're doing a bit with a guitar player and then the next day maybe you're doing stuff with the bass player and then or the vocals so you're getting that change of seeing i suppose for the musicians, I think they have no, to... No, not yet. You, no, seen, everyone, um, everyone's talking about it. Have you I, seen um, no. the Beatles? Uh, <laughs> you not? Oh, wow. There's a lot of videos. So I watched it with my wife, Jane, and there's a lot of videos. <laughs> there's a lot of them just fannying about <laughs> and playing a lot of their old <laughs> stuff, but with yeah. like a comedy voice or just joking around. And there's a lot of it, <laughs> and um, and I was saying to Jane, yeah, I yeah. think you know you do you do get that you get that a lot of people just asking about or yeah. playing a song as jokey characters because you, you you would go a bit mad, mm -hmm. and in a way you're kind of it's like cleaning the palette before yeah. you do another take yeah. of that same song again because you haven't got it in the last takes. Yeah. I suppose you're trying to peak a bit like a an. an a, an athlete um, you play through it a few times there'll be a peak like, like the third or fourth time you're really trying to get it yeah. and if they haven't got the take then they my memory of, of, of when you would very kindly record us um in the studios was i i mean we were only there like three three or four days probably at the at the, at the most but i just found it so hard no matter how many pool tables there are or ping pong or yeah you know whatever other distractions actually it's just so hard to be in that space for um such a long time with the same people um and so little to do you know so it's just just nothing to do but listen to that song over and over again but i was always amazed i was always struck by how you were you know that wasn't the case for you because you were running around like a sort of headless chicken the whole time you know dragging a mic from one room to another and plugging this in there and you know working like a there wasn't really any down to, so you, you, I can understand how it was probably difficult, different for you because you you were just so busy. You didn't have, really have time to, um, or you were concentrating yeah. on the sound of that hi hat. Whereas for the rest of us, it was just like, oh god, yeah. it's another two hours till I get to play my bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I can. You know, I think for the musicians, it's much worse. I think it's much worse. Um, yeah, because you're the scene, the thing you're working on is different. And I guess, I guess, like in the same way that maybe, maybe you wouldn't know no. the difference between the, the no. a compressed yeah, yeah. sound on a thing or, or not on, you know, or some of the technical things. Once you, once you start hearing those things more and then you're listening out for them, yeah, yeah there's suddenly more something that might seem simple, it's just bass guitar, or it's just a drum take to, to, to the lay person. To, to, if you're engineering, it, yeah. that's a whole bunch of different things that go. Well, wait till you hear so how bad the quality of the sound on this is. Than it might seem to an outsider. <laughs> and then you'll say, oh, why didn't he use a compressor? Um, yeah. you, maybe you can help me out. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah. But the um, like you say, the moving around a lot that changed when everything moves onto computer. Well, that's going to be my and next question. You, you started me, in about ninety three, something like that, ninety four, and then when 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 did you? When was like the last time you were in the? Yeah, it was about ninety three. Like what? Over how many years? Oh, okay. All right. Uh, okay. Twenty. But, 
18. I th- I, I, you, you, anyway, what I was going to say was you must yeah, have seen so a big change out in that period yeah. from sort of reel to reel to um, Pro Tools and stuff. Enormous, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it was reel to reel tape when I started. Um, and Pro Tools did exist, digital recording did exist, but it was massively expensive i think to have the systems and i think they were using it in mastering suites in london in the 90s yeah, i remember it being talked about in the 80s. i think i think they'd been developing it in the 80s so people were using it but it wasn't standard it wasn't standard at all and mastering suites had this thing called sadie where they would load in the audio files and they could see it on the screen and do their editing and the, the, the mastering stage Obviously, at that point, to handle more than just two tracks of something it would have been harder to synchronize them and to play them back and do all the converting from audio to digital, from, from analog to digital. <laughs> so, and we used to we used to dream about it. We used to talk in kind of hushed tones about imagine we can do that in the studio because it, it was becoming clear this will become a standard some at some point. Um or at least it will be used by a lot more studios. But yeah, we were exclusively on tape and then digital tape came in and we had digital tape machines that we would then convert, we would then archive analog tape to that. And I guess people were a bit, oh, it's such a pain using tape, isn't it? You have to clean the tape machine and you have to, and tape is expensive. Wow. It's like 150 quid for a reel of tape which, on which you'd get three songs. Um, and then you've got to art, you've got to have a backup tape for that tape. So you're already talking 300 quid for the, for just the tape for three songs that you might use on three takes that to tape. And they're just takes that never got used and the label's got to archive it and you have to keep it for some, you can't just throw it away. So it was, I think people were, well, you would naturally kind of get fed up of that. And the idea that, oh, it could all be on a computer and you can do a hundred takes and it, and it's great and you'll be able to chop and change and then actually the reality i found me personally it was not as exciting it's not a good it's in terms of the the way you work yes it's great to be able to do this that and the other but it does yeah. change the way you work so there's much less up and downing to and froing into the library and back again. There's less of that and you're getting up and you sometimes you have to just stand up, even if it's just to stand up to get to the other bit of the desk to press the yeah. button. Um, yeah. And desks are, desks are nice. I love desks. I love yeah. putting your hands on the faders and doing stuff. Yeah. And there's a thing over there and a thing over there. And, and then when it's all condensed into just one box, yeah, kind of, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm generalizing a bit, but you are basically just sat in one place in front of a computer screen. It's very different to what to what you, you know to what it used to be like, as you will know. Yeah. And it was a more collegiate thing as well. They're like you'll remember when we were putting mixes down, someone would someone else would have that end of the desk and be controlling the faders <laughs> there, and you're doing something here while you're putting the final mix down. And it was quite fun, you know. Yeah, everyone's involved and it's a crazy like everyone sailing a ship or something yeah exactly all hands on deck and all that and then <laughs> and then that turns into just you hitting hitting a button on a keyboard and usually no one's even there anymore when you're putting the mix down because there's, there's no jobs to do the computer's doing it all yeah yeah so for me it became a bit a bit soulless and just not as enjoyable just not not as much fun did it have an effect also? I mean, I don't know what the situation is now, but have lots of studios sort of closed? Oh, yeah. Loads. Now that everyone can do it at home on their yeah. computer, you don't yeah. really need to go into these. Huh? Awful. Let people yeah. do these things for themselves. No, it's brilliant. <laughs> it has transformed the way people record music now, hasn't it? There are obviously still big studios, but I can't imagine any of them aren't struggling in some way or have had to diversify into other things into film and music and archiving yeah loads and loads of studios have closed i mean there used to be just hundreds and hundreds in london and now they've all you know most of the big ones have gone so did that what happened to phil's studio what the one the one you worked um, on did that... a very rich computer 
chip inventor bought bought the house and the studio in the yeah. late nineties. Phil sold, and we moved up and built a new studio in London in Queens Park. And he kept it as a studio for himself, just a private studio. But I think he mothballed it after a while. I think he was trying to sell it. Last I heard, but that was never really. That was a private studio that Phil used to let out commercially for, for periods. But it, um, it wasn't like a, somewhere like uh, somewhere like Townhouse or Metropolis in yeah. London that exists purely as a as a as a commercial enterprise. Um, so why, what, 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 what caused you to stop then? A combination of lack of work, which is partly because there weren't so many studios and because people are doing it themselves, maybe a, a devaluing of what an engineer does in a way. I think similar thing to what might be happening with film at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. And um, photography. We talked to Tim Payton the other day and right. similar things. Yeah, I'm sure everyone would love to have a famous, uh, really gifted, artistic, you know, photographer. But when it's like, uh, how much is that going to cost us? Oh, and how much is the uh, AI guy going to cost us? Uh, uh, let's do the AI guy, shall we? <laughs> yeah. You know, we'll get the proper guy next. Yeah, I think music industry went through that, went through that period in the 90s and the noughties. And uh, um, yeah, it's, it's cripple it's ch well it's changed it hasn't it there's more music being made now than ever i guess mm. with people doing it themselves but i think there has without sounding like an old <laughs> grumpy old man i think that has changed the sound quality of things but that also you know with you... mp3s as well didn't it there was that huge debate yeah. about mp3s and analog sound and digital sound and all those debates still still go on um, there has been a yeah, it's kind of been downgraded, hasn't it, as a thing that people care about. Who but who goes out now and buys techniques? Well, you need a separate amp, don't you? And you need the cassette uh, <laughs> technique. You, do, you? you know yeah. who does that anymore? It's all just played off your phone. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, yes, it's questionable whether you should spend a fortune on uh, make it on high kind of production ideals when you're recording it when people at the end of the day are, are, are listening on mp3s ultra compressed files yeah. yeah so do you do you miss it did you miss it yeah i do miss it i miss being in studios with uh with musicians i miss the, the smell of recording studios <laughs> you know i miss the environment and i miss being around musicians and making albums i don't I mean, sitting there and operating the computer would be part of that. I don't miss that. I think that was actually slightly unhealthy. Yeah. It was becoming unhealthy in terms of like bad back, you know, just yeah. <laughs> just those kind of things, those kind of small issues um, were becoming uh, were becoming a bit more. It, that that was affecting my working day more and your working week. And as you obviously you get older. And um, you can't do the long hours as much. It's not quite as much fun being there at two in the morning when you've got young kids. Yeah, and you know yeah, what yeah, yeah. you know what you're going to have to deal with when you get home and the next morning before you come back to work. So it's less fun. You can't be quite as debauched as you used to be. <laughs> and um, and deadlines maybe were tighter. It wasn't as I mean, like when I started. It was there was a bit more of that relaxed. A rock and roll is what people would say, isn't it? Yeah. At, and budgets got tighter and things budgets too. Budgets get tighter, yeah. Rec the people who work at labels are slightly different. Um, and it was just a bit more clinical, yeah. And that, yeah. That's more, I'm talking more about the general working out there with bands, maybe you don't know. You still have a relationship with the art. Like I did stuff with Paul in the, in the you know, 2010 and 2015. And that was still great fun because he's, Again, he had his own studio by then, another one he bought himself, mm -hmm. Black Barn. So he can do what he wants and work however he wants. But again, that was on computer. He had left tape behind. And um, so it was, 
yeah, just in all general areas, it wasn't as much of a fun job. But working with Paul was still fun, or with Phil. Yeah. And you'd have to go and do six weeks with this other band you'd, you'd not met before in a studio in London, <laughs> commercial studio in London. And those kind of gigs were getting less and less fun, to be honest. Yeah. 